University of Washington. Mm -hmm. Today is the 6th of October, 2022. Being recorded. Okay, so this is great because this is the first hybrid regular meeting um, after the pandemic. Um, so this is wonderful and hello to everyone who's in the, the Zoom verse. And um, I don't know how many we have. My name is Lourdes Tomorrow. I'm president of the Amalaki Society of um, And so like you heard, we're recording the, the meeting. So if you are, would like to stay anonymous, just keep your video off. Uh, and then you'll find the recorded talk in our YouTube channel. That's going to be available on the chat link um, for you to go there and check out our previous talks that we've been recording, which we've been doing this uh, over Zoom. So we have a great crowd in front of me. Uh, I don't think you can see, <laughs> but um, yeah, we have a really awesome talk today and we have a lot of different items. Um, but first, we will do, uh, Mr. Secretary, will you please read um, the minutes from our last regular meeting? Sure. So, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. What I'm going to do is uh, the last meeting in May, Plus the annual event, there's no need to uh, uh, vote or correct any errors that I might possibly have made until the end of both of them. President Lourdes tomorrow, call to order the 1229th regular meeting of the Intermolecular Society of Washington at 7 p.m. on May the 5th. 2022. The meeting was virtual due to the COVID-19 pandemic with 24 members and guests in the thing. At the request, then tomorrow, recording secretary Gary Hizzle read the minutes of the April meeting, and these were approved by the audience. President-elect Matt Buffington reported the details of the upcoming annual banquet, noting that the date is June the 9th and will be held at the Auburn Naturalist Society of Woodham. The speaker will be Jay Hostler, an educator who uses simple cartoons to relate stories about insects, and the presentation will be at 1 p.m. President Chamorro then call for news of new members, old business, new business, and exhibitions without response. Program Chairman Alan Norbaum introduced the speaker of the evening, Yvonne Marie Minton whose presentation was titled Bogus Balloons, Bats, and Bio-Surveillance. Dr. Linton is currently the Research Director at the Walter Reed Biosystematics Unit. The collections at the Museum Support Center include some 1.7 million specimens, mostly mosquitoes, and accommodated and accommodated 60 visiting researchers last year. Dr. Linton is a co-author of the two-volume Mosquitoes of the World recently finished and she displayed pages from the books to show the enclosed information. There are 3,570 species of mosquitoes in the world, and the books provide illustrated diagnostic characters of each gene. Pathogens associated with each mosquito species are included. There have been several programs and research results developed in the past decade, and the Smithsonian collections of whether MSC are an integral part of such efforts. DNA analyses have allowed researchers to develop substantive, substantive results in mosquitoes, other biting flies, and ticks. Worldwide cooperation has resulted in surveys of pathogens in mosquitoes and other disease during arthropods. Extensive surveys have provided information on normal pathogen levels that allows predictability of future outbreaks, the expansion of related programs will be demonstrably important in issue of human health. The meeting was adjourned at approximately 8.30 p.m. Here's the annual banquet. The annual banquet at the Entomological Society of Washington was held at the Alden Naturalist Society on June 9th at 1 p.m. 
The event was in person with virtual linkage. There were an estimated 40 years and members of the, at the event, with more than 20 turning, tuning in virtually. The speaker was Jay Hostler, an entomologist and cartoonist who teaches at Juniata College in Pennsylvania. He was introduced by President Elect Matt Buffington. The title of his presentation was When Entomologist, Entomology and Comics Collide. Dr. Hostler began his cartoon work by posting short cartoons on the internet and now produces cartoons as small books directed to children. In middle school, he noted that, uh, noticed that youngsters lost interest in science. He has worked to change that pattern. Kids are thrilled with explanation and discovery and know enough to sort the real from the unreal. They must be encouraged to be enthusiastic about the natural world. In cartoon work, first comes science that you want to explain, followed by the creation of stories. One of the problems is showing emotions on insect faces, but this is done by an antennae. Telling stories can create a bond with nature for youngsters, although some have to be nudged. Cartoons are short and affordable. One doesn't have to be an artist, some cartoonists use stick figures. Dr. Hawksler has had success by asking young audiences about the features of a bee and gets intelligent answers to draw the bee with correct parts. Children, children also love to talk about their own experiences with insects as they engage with cartoonists. After the talk, Dr. Hustler's comic books were available by purchase from the bookstore, and he autographed them by request. Matt Buffington deserves a big thank you for cheering the speaker and engaging in all of the other details involved with this special event. <laughs> so I'd like um, to ask for a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Okay, I think a second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, now we move on to the reports of officers and committees. And I'd like to start um, by updating the membership that uh, society's new curator. So Nick Silverson uh, served as our curator for several years um, and he has now moved on as he's starting graduate school um, in the Northeast. And so he formally submitted in writing his resignation um, as our bylaws uh, indicate. <laughs> And now we're very, very pleased to introduce Elisa Seaman as our newly appointed curator. Then come up at some point so that people can, can see you in the camera. Oh, uh, if you'd like. I mean, there, there is a camera here. So, um, and I can just very quickly read a little bit about, about Alyssa. She's already been a great help. Um, picked up very quickly the role of curator, and she has fulfilled a lot of the the requirements and come very quickly to, to, to that point. Mm -hmm. um, Alisa uh, is a longtime uh, associate of the museum here at the, in Washington, D.C., and she ser currently serves as um, the Systematic Entomology Laboratory ORISE Museum Specialist. So please welcome me in, uh, or uh, join me in welcoming us. Now we already have. <laughs> So now, um, any of the officers who are present, if they would like to take the floor to give any updates on any issues? No? Yes, Mike Buffington raises his hand. Yes. So as president-elect, as president uh, my one of my duties after doing the banquet is to organize the auditing committee and the nomination committee. And I have formed both um, using the same volunteers from last time. They both uh, enthusiastically said they would agree. And uh, so we should have a slate next meeting. Great, thank you very much. And I, and I should encourage um, the membership, if you want to serve in society, to get in contact with uh, Paul Goldstein, he's chair of the nominating committee for our, our, our 
the post that's open right now, which is President elect. Um, get into contact with him or with Matt Buckingham. Okay, so now we move on to introduction of new members and and this is usually done by our uh, recording membership and recording secretary, Elizabeth Young, but she's uh, currently unable to attend uh, either by Zoom or in person. Um, so first, what, what I'll do is I'll read the, she gave me the names of um, our four new members. So we have four new members in society and I'll uh, read them out. Michael Ferro, Sonia L. Pedrosa, Beatriz Rodriguez Velez and Makoto Tokuda. So I'd like to welcome our new members. Thank you for joining. And she also indicated that there were no new members to announce in May. So we won't be returning again. And another thing that we'd like to do is any visitors, either by, via Zoom or visitors in person, um, to please identify yourselves and to introduce yourselves if you feel like doing so. Okay. Uh, I'm Zachary Dinkovich. Yeah. And you're working? I'm a high school student. Great. Well, welcome very much. He's a great photographer. Okay. Nice. So, did first. No, I Yeah. I'm a visitor. I was invited by Matt. Um, my name is Ruthie Danielson, and I'm from Northwest Washington State. And so, I am the human that uh, was able to procure the nest, nest zero for the Asian giant hornet and donate wow. it to the, uh, to the uh, Smithsonian. Wow. So, so I am here to actually see it on display. I am thrilled that it is on display and so nicely done. And then tomorrow we're going to give a, uh, a little, uh, he calls it expert in expert house. Is yeah, um, I'm not an expert at anything. I'm a generalist, but anyway, <laughs> but I do know what happened. Uh, as we try to trap uh, and find the nest. So that, that I do know that, that on the ground, I think tells up. So it'll be fun for me. tomorrow from one to three. Anyway. Thank you. Great. 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 Thank you. And thank you for purchasing that, that nest. Well, thank you for accepting it and <laughs> keeping it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So both Matt and, and Ruthie will be there uh, tomorrow. Okay. Any, any other? Any other visitors that maybe are on Zoom? <laughs> maybe in the chat? And they can hear, I, I'm, I'm guessing, so. They haven't complained yet. Yeah, they haven't complained. Okay. Well, great. Well, welcome. Okay, so now we'll move to any unfinished business, and but we don't have unfinished business, so we'll do a new business. And one of the, the new business that I wanted to, to uh, mention to the membership is uh, we are, um, we're redoing our uh, website. And this has been a topic now with the executive committee for a while. Uh, okay, here we go. And this is what our website looks like. And it's, it's great, it's very helpful. <clears throat> Um, but I think that um, it's reached its limits and also we don't have support for, uh, for running it. So we're moving on with, um, with a new look also and new ways of kind of integrating a lot of the, the things that society needs. So membership and renewal of membership and subscription so that it can be done very effortlessly. And also if you want to, so, okay, so we'll go, we'll go. So, this is the domain design of the page. We, we're, we're still tweaking it um, and we're using Squarespace. And so, uh, yeah, we're buying the membership to, to use Squarespace, but I think that what it offers is just very helpful um, and very intuitive. And so this, this is actually a picture that Matt Bertone, our speaker, uh, has allowed us to use. Uh, so the website right now has all, all his pictures, but I encourage the membership to, to include illustrations, I'm looking at all <laughs> or uh, photographs that you've taken, and then uh, we, we can see how we integrate those into, into the website somehow. We can even have a page where we can also display sort of insights of, that our membership have, um, has taken. So yeah, so we'll have the publications and you can shop for publications. So we'll have, this makes life for our ESW curator very, very easy because now we have uh, the number of items that are present. 
and um, and then so so then we know where to ship it, and it can be shipped that right away. So it works just like a store. Um, and then you can submit your manuscript, and it goes directly into um, it goes directly into into the editor of Mark Mass. And I just discovered this while I was playing around with the with the website today is that you can actually customize merch. So I didn't know this, but we can probably make shirts and hats and so on and sell them through Squarespace. So that, that's a new thing. And then the, the different memberships and you can just renew the membership and sign up. And then if you choose the option to um, renew automatically, then uh, you will just get a notice that says, oh, it's time to renew your membership. Why don't you go ahead and do that now? So we, we're gonna charge this card. So make it easy. There's another one of Matt's photographs. Again, we will it's centric, but please offer more. Um, and this is just your membership application and so on. So that remains the same. And then we're also trying out the directory. So this is where we were trying out with me and with Matt, uh, photographs um, of each member. So if you want to have a, a little page of your for yourself. Um, so we have also key terms. So executive committee. So Matt's part of the ESW executive committee. He works on Hyman Opera, so those are two tags that are going to be linked to him. And then it's easy for the membership to ship, to search um, other people within the society. Um, and then here we just added like some little note about him that he he will give me more. But he works on Hyman Opera, he's interested in photography. And then if you wanted a map of where your laboratory is, you can add that. But again, at the bottom there, you see different tags that then we can use to filter. Okay, yeah, so. So, so in the next few weeks, we'll be sending out an email to the membership, letting them know how to sign back in to the, to the website because we have to now migrate uh, the two websites and so on. So just be patient with us as we move into that, that new website, um, but uh, it, I think it's for the best. So, so that's one of the focus on So any, any questions regarding that? Questions in the chat. So does the new web page allow member access to journal articles and struggle to get access to certain years without an Yes. So if you're a member and you pay for the membership, you'll be able to access the journal through Bio One. So you'll have a special area when you log in, and that will take you to Bio One, and you'll be able to your the Bio One articles mm -hmm. and the ones that are off copyright, those are available on DHL. So, so those you can access. And we're actually digitizing the first three issues of the mem of the memoirs, which are no longer in print and no longer available, and they're off copyright now. So those will be available for free to the membership. <clears throat> Any other questions? I hope you like the blue and simplicity of it. <laughs> but yeah, it's Something that I can. <laughs> okay, good. So, so that was um, the new business, and then uh, so we'll do presentation of notes and exhibition of specimens. So this is a really nice part of the meeting where people bring a book that they want to share, or specimens, or some new topic that uh, came up or announcement. So, first I'll, I'll go first, and the first announcement, and I'll if, if Al could join me um, for this is we. We being the society had a special issue for uh, Dr. Ray Gagne. Um, and Al was the force behind that. And Mark Metz was, was also um, great because he edited that special issue. So if you would like to say a, a few words about it, and there's some photographs of who surprised him. So he's right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can click through, or you can just stand next to me. Yeah. Yeah. No. Ray's been a longtime active member of the society, as well as a, a eminent uh, taxonomist. He's probably yeah. the, you know, the leading specialist on gold midges in the world. So we just wanted to recognize his accomplishments and show him that we appreciate him. So the um, issue should come out later this month. And uh, we had a little gathering at Ray's daughter's house last Sunday. He was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so that cool. I was there. We, we printed out copies of the cover and front and back. And that's that's what you see here. So those are all of the 
articles that his colleagues uh, submitted in honor of her. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so those are our colleagues who are there and his family. So that was... <laughs> Okay, and I open the floor for anybody who wants to share a show and tell. Their I have a little bit of show and tell. I was in the Smoky Mountains two weeks ago collecting and got some plants that were infested by different and Wow. Things got emerged. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I got the other CDs oh, anyway. That's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to pass them around. So, there's, what are they? so there's, um, there's one fly that breeds in native thistles, Circeo. Uh, it's called paracanthus, the bigger one that's in here. It's too bad you can't see the way. They're colored bristles and oh, I see spots one. and markings on the body. Mm -hmm. And then there's a little one, you almost have camping glosses. that came out of a species of Florida Alps. You say different colored bristles? Like they're yeah, like bristles some are very colored. Color white. Oh, that's and interesting. Color so is this what they yeah. came out of? Yeah, these are, uh -huh. there's a couple more of these, uh -huh. but it's, you probably can't really see them. Yeah, yeah, you might be able to put it in the Yeah, yeah. It's a flower head, it's like. Yes, yeah, sure. Have you? Yes. Yes. So, is this where you want to do this? Sure, sure. Are you going to show us? Are you going to show us some stuff? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. If you want to come up here and then. Okay. Yeah. Do you need help bringing some of it? Oh. Ooh. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah. So these. These Sam just gave me today from the B Lab. Okay. These are. Asian giant hard workers oh um, from, um, well, northern giant hard yes. workers. Sorry. Yeah, just slap. <laughs> it's, just slap. It's, it's okay. And um, so he, he gave these to me today just wow. to take back. I'm going to have to have them shipped because I, I don't have it, you know, but those are pretty cool. And I guess they soak them and then wow. drink the liquid and they do a lot of different things with them. Well, does it? Well, um, folks in Asia, different uh, parts of Asia. I mean, that's how people actually. <laughs> Die is that they go after the nest and probably don't have the, the, the yeah, right like protective gear. <laughs> um, and then yeah, these, yeah, the oh, wow. these are the, the North American horn, <laughs> northern giant hornets. Um, this was a, a, a larva, one of the many that were in the original nest. And then the first of the pupa stage, uh, and then uh, right, uh, one of the emerging queens. So you can take a look at these. They're, they're cool. They're, your, your stuff here, though, I saw some stuff here, and it's like, it is really impressive. Now, when we got the, when we got the nest back from that private property owner, um, the, the, and when I, when I gave it back to the state, they, they I knew they needed to study it. And I, said, and I wanted to take it to our local fair so we could teach the locals because we needed their engagement to look for this invasive species. Um, they weren't sure if during their study if the nest would be disturbed or hurt or, you know. So what they did is did a 3D scan of the nest, and then they used a 3D printer to make me up a, a replica, and they were testing different thicknesses of the plastic, and they made a 3D replica of, of the nest. So, you know, she goes like that and like that, so like that, right? So, so this allowed the children, at the fair to touch, feel, look, while we had the nest behind glass in our case to show them so they can put their fingers in the holes, you know, how big they are and, you know, that kind of thing. And then I had the samples that we could hand to them that they could actually hold the hornets in their hands. And that, then they had a significant emotional event, made them think it was really cool. And, and, you know, get their family engaged in looking for the hornets that were eating the paper wasps in and around their house, even if they didn't want to put up a trap. So anyway, I just, I, I think they're really cool. Yeah. And, and uh, so, so thank you. great. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you so much.
Are you drank any of that? No, I don't think I will. So we got to share? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what happens. And have you ever ate the worm? No. Okay. <laughs> I have, and I ain't doing it again. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. I brought something. Yeah, oh, you did? Okay, yeah. awesome. I'll find a home for that one. Yeah, not yet. See it. Yeah, please go ahead and, and uh, I was just getting the. Perfect. So, Alma has. Okay, so this made big news. This earlier this year, this is Salma Brandisco Palace. I identified it. It was picked up uh, at the Detroit airport, uh, feeding on uh, Lagostromia, which is Great Myrtle. Great Myrtle, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and um, and I sort of mentioned to the person in Detroit that it it hadn't been seen since 1912 when Hansen described it from Southeast Asia, and all of a sudden he went. Homeland Security got a hold of it, and all of a sudden, it's all over the, all over all of the media outlets, you know, CNN, all this stuff. Uh, it just, it was just immense. And then um, I was interviewed for a New York Times article about this because it was so unusual. And the only other known specimen at that time was the type at the British Museum in London. And after this, my colleague in Taiwan said, "We've been intercepting it." <laughs> Uh, and we've been wondering what it was. And so we're going to write a paper describing the larvae because uh, the port identifier reared it, sent me larvae and pupae. So that's the next step. So awesome. Was it brought in on live plant material? It was on seed pods. Oh. And where did it come? Uh, Philippines. Oh, yeah. yeah. What type of insect is it? It's a, it's a pyroloid. It's a cranbid moth. I mean, it's a pyralid moth, sorry. Mm -hmm. The Pyralid moth, the Nepotashiine. So the reason that I'm the only person in the world who could have identified this is because I did my dissertation on this. Um, and uh, I just happened to have type photos of all the types all over the world. So not, I don't happen to have, I have them. Mm -hmm. Made it happen. <laughs> well, great. Thank you for sharing those. That's, that's a cute little moth. Any, any other? Oh, wow. Well, Anybody else want to share anything? Okay, mm -hmm. good. Excellent. Those are awesome. I love I love meeting in person again because it was nice when we were doing it online. But this is this is more interactive. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to uh, pass on to uh, program chair Alan Warbaum, who will introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Matt Bertone. So I'll move away from here, and I will be down there. So okay, cool, great. Any questions from the yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let's fight over here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so I don't forget, uh, we have 34 Zoom participants coming yeah. here. Yeah. And our speaker next um, <laughs> month is going to be Dr. Jeff Skevington from Tag Canada. He's a good person to study uh, circuits. If anybody's seen his, um, his book about the circuits, what he's done. Um, okay, so tonight I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Matt Bertone. He has had a lifelong interest in nature and especially arthropods. He graduated from Salisbury University in 2001 with a degree in biology. He then pursued a master's degree in entomology at NC State, working on dung beetles in North Carolina, cow pastures with Dr. Wes Watson. Afterward, Matt got his PhD in Brian Wiegman's lab, working on the molecular systematics of lower differ. Um, from there, Matt was hired as a postdoc researcher on projects focusing on hymenoptera anatomy and the diversity of household arthropods. Uh, because of his general interest in uh, identifying various arthropods, Matt was hired as the entomologist in the NC State plant disease and insect clinic in 2013. And in 2019, he took over as director of the clinic in addition to his work as an artist. Matt is also an avid arthropod photographer as I'm sure you're gonna to see tonight. And 
uh, no further ado, welcome Matt. Great. Thanks, Al. Thanks, everyone. I am super excited to be here, uh, not only as a speaker, but as an attendee, because I've been wanting to come to one of these meetings for a while. So this is a really great opportunity. Um, so this is going to be a little self-centered, this talk. I don't have a research lab or focus group or anything like that. So I'm just going to talk about myself and what I do. But hopefully it'll be interesting stuff. And uh, my position is 100% extension at NC State, although I do dabble in some research and some other things. Um, do a little bit of teaching. But basically, I am now the director of the uh, NC State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. Uh, we are a diagnostic lab dealing mostly with plant issues from diseases and insects. Uh, I'm the only entomologist in the lab, and we have several pathologists, plant pathologists in the lab. Uh, we work with cooperative extension in the state uh, and people all over the country, in fact. Uh, but we serve the public, uh, private industry, government, and academia if you have a problem with identifying an organism. And a lot of you are actually familiar with that because many of you do a similar job here uh, at the SEL and, and, and whatnot. So uh, some of this will be kind of familiar, some of it might not be. Um, there is a small fee for our services, physical samples sent in, and we also get our funding through the National Plant Diagnostic Network. This was set up after 9-11 um, for national security, for biosecurity, basically to be first interceptors of and identifiers of uh, di diseases and insects that might uh, harm our agriculture. And so we, we, are, we do that role a little bit too. So my general responsibility is I provide accurate identifications or as accurate as I can get uh, of all insects and arthropods, sometimes other animals. Uh, I communicate these findings to entomology specialists for recommendations uh, on management. I don't tell anybody how to spray things because I don't know anything about that really. Um, we also train county agents and master gardeners to recognize and identify arthropods of importance, provide other entomological support for others, and also be a first detector for regulated and or invasive organisms. So, um, you know, uh, we do a lot of things in the lab. Uh, with just a little bit about the lab and what, what they what we do in the lab. So here are our samples from 2021. So we obviously have a seasonality. The summer we have the most samples in June, uh, and they're tapering off now, thankfully. So during the winter we do some housekeeping, and I actually get to curate specimens and things like that. Um, in 2021, we had about uh, almost 3,000 samples in the clinic, uh, and my samples that came to the clinic were about 751, and just email photo IDs, I did about 602 last year. So uh, lots of correspondences about critters, many of them very common, some of them very interesting or new. Uh, so it's always, uh, every day is new. You never know what's going to happen and where you're going to get in. Again, I'm probably preaching the choir. Many of you know all this stuff and you get excited about that one thing and then have two dozen other things that are everyday items that you're just, you know, this is a sport, fly, this is whatever. Um, we, uh, Excluding our turf samples, the turf diagnostic lab is another lab now. Um, we get about 40% uh, of our samples are physical only, 35% are image only. We don't charge for image samples. So if you can take a photo of an insect and submit it through our system, we we'll, and I can identify it, we send out a report on what to do about it, what it is, things like that. And then 25% are both physical and image. Oftentimes it starts as an image that's really bad and then <laughs> request that specimen or plant or especially for the disease samples, you know, diseases are obviously very difficult to identify from photos. So we have to get good samples. Uh, and the pathologists in the lab are really great. They are just like us, except for with the plant pathogens. They, they're obsessed about that stuff and really love helping people. Now, as far as the people submitting those, um, <clears throat> clients alone, like a homeowner, it's about 33% of samples. Uh, county extension agents, about 40% of samples. Uh, consultants are private or, or NCDA, our Department of Ag, uh, about 25%. And then both agents and consultants are sometimes on these samples as well. So we get a lot of different people submitting samples. Some are homeowners just walking up to the, the clinic door and handing off something. Others are county agents have, that have already talked to a client out in the county and know the proper way to submit it. We, in fact, give a, a discount for physical samples if they go to the county extension offices so that they can maybe answer the question. And if not, they know the process and they can enter it online and send it to us. Now, this is from 23, 2013 to 2018, a five-year span. Uh, there were about, these are the hosts I looked at. 
So uh, half of it is 454 different hosts of plants that came in. Uh, but many, many of the things I look at are from households and domestic pests, things like that. Uh, home and garden, just random things outside in the yard. That's our category for that. And these are actually categories uh, that are throughout the network. So every lab, uh, each state has a net, uh, lab in this NPDN network, and they all have used these same hosts. And in fact, I'm the chair of the committee that helps define these hosts and the pest names and things. Uh, humans and people, well, oaks were a lot. Of course, there's a lot of oaks. Uh, and in fact, Raleigh is the city of oaks. Um, humans, people, so again, lots of things, maples, tomatoes, pines, boxwood, you know, all the common things, and then all these kind of random posts that come. Now we do some social media too. I enjoy, of course, I'm 100% extension. Extension is outreach and, you know, training people and, and, and talking to people about things. I love to talk, uh, as you know, probably already. Um, so we do some social media. Uh, this is kind of defunct our blog, although we, we'd like to get it. Uh, we're going to move it over to our website soon, uh, but, you know, just, uh, you know, we basically, anytime a subject comes along that we repeatedly get, and it's nice to then have a full write-up so that we can just send them a link, we'll do that. So this is clover mites. We get a lot of clover mites in, and so I'll write a thing up about that, and I can just send people that link. It's really easy then. It saves me a lot of time. Uh, some of these blog posts that got a lot of traction, uh, Blame It on the Rain, part one, A Multitude of Millipedes. Uh, <laughs> so this had about 20,000 views already, uh, the other day when I looked at it. Um, you know, people wondering why there are millipedes crawling up their houses or in their houses and everything, usually after rain events. Um, we also had Blame It on the Rain, part two, which was about, about pathologists about household molds and things like that. So uh, stuff like that. Of course, the big one, uh, I wrote this actually originally in 2015. So this is way before any of the news came out about this years ago, because I would get calls from people saying, I found a Japanese giant hornet. And it was because they saw a National Geographic video of them murdering bees and they were freaked out. And I said, no, it's a European hornet, I'm sure. And so I wrote this again, because I got so many calls that say, here you go, here's a blog about it. Now I did, you can see that it's italicized. I did have to update this though, because my answer for R, and it said it used to be R Asian giant horns in North Carolina. And I said, no, I said, well, now they're in the US or in the US, I think it was originally. And I got I had to clarify now it's not in North Carolina. Uh, but now I have to say that they are in the US. They're very limited range, of course. But I went up to our collection and took photos of our specimens. These are all to scale. And we have some giant the European hornets that are bigger than the Asian giant hornet specimen we have. So when people, this is my biggest problem with all this thing, is that anybody that sees a big wasp, they assume is a giant hornet. And I said, don't use size. In fact, uh, we created some interactive uh, uh, guides to lookalikes and some of these giant things, even some of the things that don't even uh, uh, really resemble them, but you know, to a lay person, they look like that they're gonna get killed. Um, <laughs> the, the person, not the, it's like maybe both. It will, you know. <laughs> but um, if you wanna try this out, this is an interactive guide and I think we gotta change it now because of all the name changes and everything. But um, the graphic I had to put up recently, of course, is just put more detail into this because again, I say, Size is not good for ID, although nobody ever reads that, which is unfortunate because I say, they say, oh, it's, I definitely have one. I definitely have one. I was like, okay, I'm over the phone. I'm like, does it have a red head? Well, it's got some red on it. Well, if it's got any red on the head, it's not one. Okay, they have just a yellow head. Okay, does it have little teardrops on the stripes? Yeah. Well, that's a European horn. Okay, did you look at my guide? Yeah. I was like, well, I have it there laid out. And, you know, and I try to be as, 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 uh, Specific as possible, I point to all the parts and all that stuff, but still, of course, people don't really read the fine print, uh, but try to basically put this front and center so that people could hopefully see and identify these things for themselves. And of course, we don't have them in North Carolina. I tell people it's probably likely we'll never have them in North Carolina, even if they are not uh, eradicated, because you know, European Hornet isn't even in Wisconsin yet, and it's been here for over 150 years. So. I doubt we're, it's going to come over the Rockies and all that stuff. I mean, European hornets will be on the West Coast by now, stuff like that. And I'm just not sure. I mean, I could be eating my words, but I would think it would only be in a separate introduction or something like that. If they were to move, I think it would take more than my lifetime for them to get to North Carolina. And I keep telling people, if they get here, you will know. We will tell you. And then people just don't 
<laughs> Apparently they think we're just hiding things from them, I guess. <laughs> yeah, they will know. I will be, you know. But also we have European hornets too, and people are seeing them a lot. Uh, there's much more interest. We just published an article in the American Entomologist about we had over a thousand percent increase in ID requests for these types of wasps in the last couple of years, which takes a lot of our time as well. Uh, I do Twitter. Um, I'm on Twitter. I just broke into 8,000 followers, which is pretty cool. Um, I started in 2012 when Morgan Jackson, a uh, dipterist, said, hey, you should sign up for Twitter. I'm like, okay. And he's like, you can put pictures on there. I was like, okay, I'll do that. Um, and so I put all my pictures on there and uh, I do geeky bug stuff and like to retweet all the weird things that I find on Twitter, which is always fun. Um, and uh, really enjoy that. And I know some of these people here from Twitter or I knew them before and know them on Twitter and see more of their activities on Twitter. Um, I also, at one point, um, I had to deal with them, uh, uh, help identify and calm people's nerves, especially in North Carolina about frown recluses. So we started uh, with a few at Twitter Pete folks, we started recluse or not. Uh, and for a couple of years, I think two or three years, I was actually answering a lot of them. I have now left it to somebody else because I have all these other things going on. And I'm so grateful for other people uh, carrying this on. But yeah, we actually, one of the first samples, uh, major samples I got into the clinic, and you know, with the first six months, I think, there was a large brown recluse that uh, a child rolled over onto and got bit, um, and then went to the hospital, had uh, basically what's called systemic loxosalism, which means the venom destroys the blood cells, and the child almost died. Uh, that was a confirmed case, but I knew that recluses were really rare in North Carolina. They're, they're only in spot populations. Then the physician said, oh, we have another case where a child, you know, you had the same symptoms, all that stuff. And I was like, I'm not sure. I don't, I wouldn't want to include that in a kind of case report. But they're like, okay. So, and I said, well, let me contact the family. And so I contacted them and uh, was able to go over the house and found several dead brown recluses and said, okay, now this is pretty good evidence that, that this is, you know, the same thing. So then we published a paper for uh, science, for doctors in non endemic areas of brown recluses to recognize some of the symptoms of the systemic loxosalism because both children were very severely affected and almost died, um, which is rare. And I, I do stress that, but it happened twice in North Carolina, which is kind of rare. Oh, a question? Yeah. That's true. No, I, sure. I'm just wondering if there's any guess of how they got there, like through wood shipping. Or I don't know. It, how it works. A lot of people. Were, so well, the first. So I've been in North Carolina for 12 years, and I'd never seen a recluse. They are not in most of North Carolina. You can't find them at all. Like you could go out searching. Uh, even our study for homes, I searched 50 homes, didn't find a single one. You, you can't find them. So Jim Baker, who is a really famous uh, um, uh, ornamentals and garden entomologist from NC State. He said, oh, uh, you want to see some brown recluses? My parents' house in Cary, where I live now, it's this little old house. They moved there from Alabama or Tennessee, and you know, they moved from Alabama and Tennessee to North Carolina, and they brought some recluses with them. Well, those some recluses turned into hundreds of recluses. And so I was able to pick up every box in there and find recluses everywhere. Luckily, they said nobody had ever been bitten, and they lived there, fine, all that stuff. That's where actually a lot of my photos came from or first specimens ever came from. Uh, now I know of several places in North Carolina that have them. In fact, downtown Raleigh has Mediterranean recluses in some of the buildings. Uh, but the weird thing about recluses that people don't understand is that they never leave the house once they get there. So we did get one of the a link to the previous story is that I got a sample from uh, Durham and North Carolina. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. It's like, and I didn't get the address. I'm like, where's the address? And it was that same apartment complex where the one child got bit. And it was years later, and it was a shared walls, but across the parking lot, you probably never find them. You have to move them from one place to another. They don't naturally spread out. Because they've been in North Carolina for over 40 years, we'd expect them to be everywhere, uh, but you can't find them hardly. They're so, yeah, they're reclusive. But even if I go try and find them, it's almost impossible. So anyway, this is a really great uh, Twitter service to help people identify what their recluses are or not. Yes. You know, we do have some here. Yeah, yeah. And they usually find them like in warehouses that they think they came in on something. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I read that there was a American entomologist uh, thing about the in the DC and like the steam area, like the the boiler rooms, kind of the, the basements, and they were feeding on termites. And I think it was oh. Mediterranean recluses too, which are more kind of urban. Uh, they they get into like the the buildings a lot. 
Yeah, and, I, I don't know if they've had any populations, but I know there have been samples brought into the Arlington Extension Office. Okay, yeah, I think they had an established population here. They're just kind of very secretive, okay. of course. They're in the, the kind yeah. of guts of the building and nobody ever goes down there. Uh, we do also, I know I got sent some from Paul Merrick at Virginia Tech. They have a building that has, uh, wow. I think it was Mediterranean recluse also. But yeah, I guess, I don't know if you like recluses, you're lucky then, or, I don't know. But <laughs> they're, they're fine spiders. I kept them for a while on my desk too and show people who came through the lab, of course, because I'd ask them, oh, is it bigger or smaller than you thought? Or, uh, you know, I'd throw it up. No, I wouldn't throw it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a really, it, it's really great because, you know, uh, you'll see it across my talk that, I feel like I'm putting out fires a lot because there's so much uh, misinformation and also just general anxiety about a lot of these critters out there. And speaking of that, it's not just insects. Uh, I've had to write fact sheets about terrestrial flatworms, land planes, and ha hammerhead worms, as well as jumping worms, two different groups of non-insects or non-arthropods that unfortunately I've had to kind of uh, bone up on because of all the mass hysteria about it. I get calls just about every every other week about one of these worms. The jumping worms, people are afraid of them just eating all their plants and stuff. They're not actually afraid of them, but they are invasive. Although both of these types of worms have been in North Carolina for decades. Uh, but people are now with the internet, I think, are starting to see them and recognize them and thinking, oh man, this is something new in my yard. No, it's probably been there for decades. And the hammerhead worms, they found a tetrodotoxin in them. They produced one of the they're the only land threshold invertebrates known to produce the tetrodotoxins, which is the pufferfish toxin. So then you say that, and of course, people are just really calm about that <laughs> not at all. They think that they're gonna look at you and you're gonna die or something like that. So uh, unfortunately, we have to debunk a lot of this stuff about these, these worms. Um, and uh, being an, an entomologist, having to deal with worms and stuff is really tough because we get an invasive flatworm in, I have to basically send pictures of somebody and say, hey, do you think this is something new? And because uh, I'm not going to accept them. I, I don't, I'm not going to do anything. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's getting thrown into it and you get all these random questions, of course. So another another group of organisms that freak people out. Um, another thing I do, of course, as you all do, is specimen collection and curation. I have not curated enough, so this number should be higher, but I've, I've donated, I deposited about 1,700 specimens to the collection. Mostly handpicked the really interesting ones that come through and added new families to the collection, new new groups, because you know they're generally things that people don't collect on, uh, or they come in and they're interesting. Um, hopefully this winter I get more time to do it, but as a director, we've got I've got other things to think about too, and the plant pathology side, all that stuff. But it is my passion, and it's really enjoyable to get like a little bit of time to sit and label things and, and identify them. Of course, photography is a major part of my life. I really enjoy uh, macro photography. I got into it about, now it's about 14 years ago, uh, you know, being inspired by Alex Wild and, and Nikki Bay and a lot of the really good insect photographers. And I was like, I'm gonna try it. And I just, you know, practice over years, thousands of photos. And uh, so I post them up on Flickr, most of them, I, I really need to get more up there. I actually use them for my talks, like to grab the photos, because it's the best way for me to find them, unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess. Um, but yeah, I really love photography. I'm not going to talk much about this, but if anybody has any questions afterward or, or wants to talk, chat about them, uh, I'd love to talk, to them, talk more about it. Now, of course, I do a little bit of research and publications. Uh, um, there's, a, there's a left one. Hey, look at that. Uh, that was, I think, my only purely left paper. So there you go, Alma. And it's a pyroloid suit. So, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, practical things uh, in monitoring for Drosophila suzukii, uh, new parasitoid of emerald ash borer, um, the description of a new bee fly of Madagascar. So it's very random. It's very random. And even more so, uh, my recent noteworthy papers, uh, I've been really into areophyoid mites lately. Uh, which uh, I like taking live photos of them now, um, that which nobody does because they're a quarter of a millimeter long, um, but they're really charismatic and they're on just about every plant out there. And they're really cool looking when they're on slides. You get these feather, their feather claws and, and really this, this is a diplomyopid, which has this crazy dagger-like mouth parts and they're just really amazing, but they're a quarter of a millimeter long. So they look like dust to most people. And uh, I found four new species on campus just. Uh, it's 
not hard to find them. Uh, but I was inspired when I went and took the mic course out in Arkansas and uh, Russian uh, colleague, Philip Chedverikov, he came and he said, everybody go out and collect plants and bring them back and look under the scopes and we're gonna find area bioids and then we're gonna mount them and we're gonna key them out. And I was like, yes, and we had so much fun. And I stayed there until like eight at night mounting mites. And I was just like, okay, I'm doing this. And so I am still a novice at it, but this is a new species that came into the clinic. It was, I was looking at uh, a giant sample of hazelnuts that had a bunch of disease issues, had a bunch of insects on it. And I was looking at the leaves and found these, these mites, which I was looking for, collect a bunch and I sent them to my colleague and I, I identified a genus, but I was like, I don't know, I can't get the species. So he said, it's brand new, so let's do it. Let's describe it. So this is gonna be published soon. Um, then I am very happy and proud to be, have published now with Dr. Ray Gagne, uh, the, uh, um, on, a, on a midge, a really cute little midge. Um, I do whenever I rear or find midges in the lab, which I'm not, I'm not good at with them, but I enjoy them, especially really cute ones like this. And I always send Ray a message or say, hey, you want some specimens of this? And he's happy because I also collect a lot of them. So I sent him dozens of these at Larby. These were on a sample of scale of, of a cherry laurel that had a huge scale insect infestation. And the, the client wanted, this is a consultant, wanted for the client to identify the species of scale. I do love scales, especially armor scales too. But I could not find a single good specimen on there because they were all eaten by these maggots. Oh. And luckily though, the maggots are cool too. I love them. So I reared a bunch of them and we did a paper on uh, this, this genus of, uh, of predatory midge. Uh, Gaulmage, so very cool. And then uh, I guess one of the weirdest kind of most fun papers recently was uh, novel power, power amplified jumpy behavior in larval beetles. So I don't know if you, this was in the news, this was on NPR and other things, but uh, I work closely with uh, Adrian Smith who does all this slow motion insect videography and he's at the museum downtown. We're always looking for projects to work on. I'm the person that's like, that would be cool to, to do, to film. And he's like, I'm gonna, we're gonna figure out how to film it then. So I was plucking some bark from a dying oak out right behind our building and found a bunch of larvae and beetles and all these things I just brought them all back to lab. And as I was photographing one of these larvae, it hopped and I was like, okay, that's interesting. And so then I went to a seminar right afterward where Adrian was and I mentioned it to him and I was like, I didn't even make the connection. He's like, we gotta film that. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, of course we do. <laughs> so, uh, so then I took photos and we took a bunch of specimens back to his lab. We filmed them all this stuff and basically wrote this paper. This is the first instance of jumping larvae and beetles like this, that basically what they do is they, uh, this is a lima float, a flat line, a line flat bark beetle larva, and it, uh, it grips the ground with its claws and then tenses up its body and then lets go. It lets the claws go and it, it tumbles and, and somersaults in the air. Um, so it was a really fun paper, um, a little bit atomized zone, but we also kind of summarized some of the jumping larvae in, 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 in insects as well. And then after the paper came out, everybody's like, oh, I saw, you know, I, I got a call from somebody who's brought in firewood and said, oh, I've seen that before. I was like, oh, maybe, I mean, totally could happen. And then people would be like, oh, I know another one that jumps. And then, so maybe we'll have, an, have to have an addendum for that one. So many different kinds of larvae. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and all different types and uh, things like that. Yeah, like uh, parasitic ones, and then ones in in galls, and ones in uh, you know, there's there's so many different types. But uh, and fly maggots. We did a whole video on some of the fly maggots. We found some uh, uh, lampeid flies. Um, actually, yeah, there you go. Tough I mean, uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah uh, lampeid flies. And we did a whole video on the jumping lampeid. It was the daisy ops that was jumping, and you published papers talking about them uh, jumping too. So. Yeah, it seems to be like kind of random in peppercoat flies. Like cheese skipper. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, exactly. Even some Drosophilus do apparently, and all this stuff. It's like really, yeah, just coming literature. Yeah. How high do they get? Uh, so, so it's only those are only that's five millimeters. So it's only about a centimeter high, and I think oh, four okay. centimeters long. It's not actually. <laughs> I I mentioned this on NPR. <laughs> so so I mentioned this on NPR. I said I think or Science Friday I said. It's not all that impressive without qualifying for an insect, because many of the insects can hop better than these. And, and Adrian said, oh yeah, they're not super impressive compared to other insects. And I, but I forgot to qualify. 
And they're like, you can't jump that well. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. I, they, they are pretty impressive actually, but <laughs> relative to other insects, some other insects, they do not jump as far, yes. Yeah, uh, what purpose does it serve? I mean, they're under bark or- Yeah, so that's that's one of the things we were trying to figure out. Now, unfortunately it's an ephemeral resource. So we couldn't have, we didn't have a lot of larvae to, to uh, use in experiments, um, but our hypotheses were, it was either an artifact of some behavior they do under the bark, which I didn't think was as likely. Uh, what I think it is, is because the bark can slough off very easily on those dead trees and things like that, when they're open and exposed, it's much more energy efficient to jump than it is to run. And they crawl and then they hop and they hop much better and they probably randomly get to a safe space. So that's our hypothesis. We didn't have enough larvae to, uh, to experiment with and see but one of the cool things about this is that a uh, Japanese researcher, an expert on this group, saw our videos and said, oh, I have another hopping one here from Japan. And so apparently it's widespread within the family. Uh, and so it's definitely up for more exploration. So I definitely would uh, encourage people to hop, or hop to it. <laughs> And then even some disease papers. So I, you know, get my photography, taking pictures of downy mildews, things like that. So I do even publish on diseases, which is never, I would never would have thought. Uh, I've got a, a, a collaboration. This is actually from uh, Dr. Sarah Knudy at, at, at UConn. She studies nest, bird nest parasites and she's an ornithologist. So she was on Twitter saying, I have all these parasites. I don't know how to identify them. I'm like, hey, I love parasites. <laughs> so <laughs> actually way better than plant stuff, honestly. But uh, so she sent me all this stuff and I started identifying it. So we've identified the blowflies, the fleas, the mites, and there's predatory mites and dust mites and things like that in it. So it's, it's a really fun project working with bluebirds and, and tree swallows. Okay, so the good things about my job. So engaging clients with diverse backgrounds and needs, uh, many people are surprised that our service exists, which is really nice. Uh, most are extremely grateful. Uh, I feel like I'm actually helping, making a difference and with something I'm passionate about. And so, you know, answering the phone, answering in the door, or emails, uh, you know, it's really enjoyable to talk to people about these things and they have to listen to me. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, we do uh, these really cool webinars every other every month uh, where we talk about uh, Mike Munster here. He does the pathology, you know, garden, you know, this is for extension master gardener volunteers, so they can get training. And we talk about each month. We talk about different subjects. Sometimes we'll talk about springtails or talk about you know uh, soft flies or whatever. Uh, and he'll talk about you know tomato diseases or you know this stuff and that. Of course, I don't know all, but uh, we do a lot of. Uh, of these uh, programs like uh, fostering uh, youth uh, scientists and um, uh, master gardener workshops, agent, we do a lot of clinic tours. People come in and learn what they do, what we do. We also try and train them on how to best submit a sample, how to collect a good sample that will be then the best for accurately and timely identification. Uh, I love fostering entomology, of course, uh, or at least arthropod appreciation. So talking about spiders or other outreach extension dogs, just fun ones too. This is just random weird invertebrates that I figured nobody had heard of and I need to make them aware of them. Uh, rearing things is really good if you can do it successfully. I'm not the best at it, but it's fun. This one was cheating because it was already a pupa. So uh, I just have to sit and wait for it to come out, but it's a beautiful moth, uh, even though it's a pest. So. For me, I'm the one that says, oh, what a beautiful moth. And the growers are like, yeah, no, that's terrible. I hate it. So <laughs> there's always that dichotomy of like uh, me really being excited about something when somebody brings something to the door and, I'm, and they're like, yeah, it's eating everything. And I was like, okay, well, I guess we'll kill it. <laughs> okay, the bad. Uh, so invasive species, of course. So potential threats to agriculture. Since I started, we've had 18 new arthropods to North Carolina that I've identified. Um, and more even that I have not identified. These are just the ones that have come through the clinic. Uh, this is a, a really cool looking um, Bostrichid beetle that came in from packing crates from India. Uh, luckily, these won't survive in North Carolina, uh, but we of course have a lot of the expected ones, emerald ash for sugarcane aphids, which hopped over from sugarcane to sorghum. Uh, and so they then spread throughout the Southeast. Uh, crate myrtle bark scale, uh, Cannabis aphid, because now we have the hemp program and all that stuff here. So um, I suspect it was already in the state, uh, but uh, now that the hemp program was there, we identified it. 
And this year we got Spinal Lantern Fly, yay, oh, and uh, Elm Zigzag Salt Fly. So, yes, I I wasn't super. I was I was not as worried as I should be. And now that they're in North Carolina, I'm like, oh my god, they're gonna be all over my backyard at some point. Uh, hopefully, their population crashes to a manageable level, like kudzu bug and things like that. Um, but we'll see. Uh, unexpected things. This was a, a plant that came out of a nursery, um, and it. The, uh, the person went back to the nursery and said, there's something weird going on with this plant. What's going on? And they said, oh, they're thrips. And the agent the very, was very astute and said, that's not thrips. It looks like a plant mouse. I was like, oh, yeah. And I was like, okay, send it to me. And I was like, oh, there's, from the, from the catalogs and everything, there's no known, uh, this, is an, this is on Japanese Pits Forum, which is an exotic, you know, uh, just uh, ornamental plant. And I looked in the uh, the Siloid catalog and found that it was this uh, Cacosilla tobiri. Um, it was only, this is the second time in the Western Hemisphere it had been found. Uh, it was already in, in uh, California in 2007. And then as I was about to publish this paper, somebody said we found him in South Carolina. So I had to update it very quickly. And then a couple of weeks ago, I got, uh, maybe I shouldn't say, I got some information about it too. Uh, uh -oh. but. But, uh, but basically, it feeds only on Pitts Forum, luckily, but it, because it's planted widely in subtropical areas and North Carolina being subtropical and tropical, uh, we do get some of these pests that you probably wouldn't get up here. Yes? What was occurring in that bottom right here? So uh, this one right here? Yeah. That is a nymph that has a wax yeah. uh, excretion. So they, they create these wax filaments out of their back end. Uh, and the adults are really adorable, I think, but they make a mess of the plant, of course. I say that about everybody, every insect. You'll, you'll get to like... Then there are native species creeping up, probably from climate change. Uh, so we've got some some of the palm skeletonizer moths are becoming more abundant in the southeast. Uh, we got a new, uh, actually, Lou Dietz, who is, was, trained me in taxonomy <laughs> and uh, was a, did work on scales before, named uh, Melanaspis decoli. And up until I got there, it hadn't been found in North Carolina. It just crept up uh, into that southeastern part. The southeastern part is so kind of subtropical that we get a lot of these things. <gasps> Emerging <laughs> pests, yeah, it's a weevil. <laughs> it's a cool weevil. Uh, so this was a really interesting situation. So uh, <laughs> these these uh, growers that were producing uh, rapeseed uh, were having their their plants just melting, just like rotting and everything. And they brought them into me and they said, oh, there's worms in the stem. And I looked and it was, it was actually maggots. There were, uh, there were, uh, uh, you would be a picture with maggots, but there were holes and they said, oh, there were these also. And there were these tiny, this is, you know, this one's a little magnified, but this one is the size of that rape seed right there. Very tiny Um, And I identified it, well, tentatively as paladactylus. And luckily I sent some images to Charles O'Brien, who was alive at the time and was really excited because he had very few specimens in this collection. It's a weird thing. It was detected first in 1895 and up kind of in New England area, kind of laid low, very rare. And then we had this outbreak of this and I had to figure out how, what its life cycle was in North Carolina so that they could figure out how to treat, spray for the adults, things like that. So I actually had them bring in plants that were infested and I sat them in the lab and tried to rear them in the lab. And I, I did actually get them to pupate and kind of, said, you know, qualified it with, well, this is kind of room temperature and lab conditions, but we can try and extrapolate and stuff. But they've had a couple issues with it still every once in a while, but who knows if that'll pop its head back up. But it's, it was a cute little weevil, but doing a lot of damage. You can see all these larvae in the, in the petioles of the, the leaves. Uh, then the CDC puts out something like this. So more than 300,000 people in the US are infected with Trypanosoma cruci. Uh, Parasite that causes Chagas disease, and most don't know it. What do you think that does? <laughs> Problem is, they didn't say 99% of them traveled outside the US to get it or came from outside the US to get it. So they never clarified that. So, of course, I have to write another blog post. So, on kissing bugs and Chagas disease in North Carolina, the kissing bugs are present. Chagas disease is actually present in North Carolina, but people just don't get it because of how they behave. We did uh, this specimen right here. I, I solicited from a person who took a photo of it and sent it for identification. I said, please send me that specimen. I don't have any photos of a, of a Eastern blood second conos. Got it in. And then I was tempted to feed it. 
Um, <gasps> and I, I almost did. So I put my finger in front of it and it whipped out its proboscis. And I was like, ooh, this is hungry. And so I then when I, I think I went on Twitter or somewhere and said, hey, should I feed this thing on me? Because, you know, I'm a weird entomologist like that. Um, and by the time I get back on Monday, it was dead. So it decided for me. I, it, it didn't feel like fighting, I guess. But people have gotten bitten. Uh, and so I wrote about this uh, to clarify the situation. Uh, again, I really enjoy med vet entomology, so I've always known about kissing bugs and seeing one. They're fairly rare. We only have about two dozen of the species, specimens of the species in our collection. But unfortunately, that also causes mass hysteria where people just smash every bug around. So I had to see all these beautiful other heteropterans uh, squished or maimed or whatever because everybody thinks it's a kissing bug. Now, luckily, it's mostly died down that, that uh, that uh, hysteria, and uh, I'm actually going to be on a kissing bug project that's being done by a bunch of veterinary veterinarians who are looking at opossums and some other uh, animals and seeing how prevalent the disease is and things like that. So I'm going to be helping with the bug side of it. In fact, we just got a specimen over to them. All right, who knows what these are? Thank you. <laughs> Wait until you find out. <laughs> well, okay. they're related. This, no, this could be a like, sample of it. What's that? It's probably on humor. This could this could come into this clinic. This oh, no. clinic. Anybody have any guesses? No way. So the coil is rat feces. I mean, uh, is wee feces. Oh, okay. And the rice-like thing is the proglottid of a of a tapeworm. Oh, really? So I've gotten those. People claiming they're coming out of their ears and eyes is is one thing, but. The butts are producing tapeworm for gods too in that house because fleas are the trans, uh, transmit tapeworm. So if you swallow a flea, you can get a tapeworm. So that was fun to learn. Uh, the first time I got them in, it looked like rice. And I was like, what is this? It's, they're very uniform, they're very similar. You know, they're probably something organic. We, we tested it to be seeds. We put, you know, iodine to see if it's starchy or not. I took it over to the vet school and they're like, yeah, it looks like a tapeworm for God. I'm like, ooh, that's weird. And it's not the first time I've gotten them now. Not me. I don't have tapeworm. But, <laughs> That I've gotten proglottids in the clinic. So I have actually a little vial of dried ones that are not with me, but if anybody ever wants to see them. Okay, now the wacky. Finally, the wacky. So, specimens from strange sites. These are blueberries, a little cottony. They came in like that. Each of the calyces of these, each calyx of these blueberries had this white cottony stuff. So, what, what do you think that is? That's like fungus. Fungus is, is pathology lab. It'd be great if it was. Yeah, but it's, it's it looks a lot like fungus. I eat them. Yeah. You eat them like that. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Oh, dude, dude. That's a uh, yeah. Well, so that was spiders in there. There were spider egg sacs. Does a mother spider like to lay her eggs in the calyx of all those those blueberries? So that was fun. So Ray, I don't know, you might want to reconsider that meeting those, but no, but yeah, it's uh it was I was not a fungus. We we of course the pathologist was like, yeah, this looks like silk or something. And I was like, oh wow, it's a tort open, and of course there's the little spiders, which I like, you know, that's actually better than the blueberry to me. But uh then we got this found in child's hair when mom was shampooing. Mother thought it was a flea as she found it one a couple nights before and could not retrieve it, but was able to salvage the sample I mailed. So this turned out to be a flat bark beetle, uh, Nesibius rapandus, and it's now the only specimen of that species in our collection. So yay for kids' hair for collecting that sample for us. So I'm really happy to you know, get weird specimens from weird locations. And obviously, I'm pretty sure I put that on the label. <laughs> and then of course, the, this actually should be in the bad section, but this is wacky, delusory parasitosis, uh, which can include specimens from very strange sites. So this is where, of course, people think that they're getting invaded uh, or bitten, invaded, their skin invaded, they're being crawled on, they're being bitten, uh, but they can't produce any specimens of any kind of biting or parasitic arthropod or anything. So you get, you know, it's like large white and liquid was on my lip after drinking a glass of milk. They're in every lotion, every toothpaste, face cream and liquid soap, shampoo and conditioner, in fridge drinks, pantry mayonnaise, mustard, spices. You then have these, uh, which, uh, just found in car, all these others, and then you have know, the fun ones like between teeth and under boob. <laughs> yeah. um, oh. And uh, bags of scabs are not uncommon. Oh. And honestly, I get about, I would say I get about one of these calls every week, just about. So I've probably dealt with hundreds of people with this. I have uh, trained uh, extension agents on how to deal with these situations. It's not easy, but I produced a little tip sheet on what I do, my strategies. 
but often I, I, I tell this story is that when we got our new phones, they actually had a little timer on them. You know, they tell you how long you've been on the phone for, and it's an, at least 20 to 40 minutes you're on the phone with one, one of these people. Yeah. And, or they'll come to the door, ask you to dig things out of your, your skin. I tell them I'm not a medical doctor. I can't do that. And so it is a difficult thing and it's not my favorite thing, but I feel like it can help a little bit. I may have helped a few people in those hundreds of people, but uh, I do get a lot of these random. Now this previous year, we did actually have uh, about half a dozen bird mite, actual bird mite cases where people were able to produce a several to hundreds or thousands of bird mites from the house. Um, and you can find them, you see them, they're, they're mites. Um, they're tiny, but uh, that's on a toothpick, for instance. But uh, you can easily produce them if you have them in your house. And actually, I got my first photos. I was uh, uh, one of the clients was kind enough to show me their bites. And I was like, okay. And they actually produced the mites too. So I was like, oh, can I get a photo of those, you know, of making anonymous and everything. So I actually have real bird mite bites on somebody. But for the most part, you never find anything. But like I call the everything bagel. It's like all the stuff if you scrape it off with everything bagel. That's what you get. All the seeds from the house, all the dead insects. They're not parasites. Balls of lint, everything like that. And then probably the most unusual sample I've ever gotten. This trumps even the delusory parasitosis stuff. Uh, so I got this. Two cicadas appear to be acting unusually. The client wants to know whether these are natural cicadas or artificial. <laughs> Please make a detailed inspection of the eyes, antennae, head, wings, and structures, anything unusual or uncustomary. I will be picking up the samples after you dissect the best cicadas. As you would agree, the Navy is not going to publicize their spy technology on the internet. Thank you for dissecting these two samples with open, investigative, scientific minds. So I talked to this client on the phone and told them to bring in the thing that I'd take a look. I, I guess I'm with that report. Um, and they walked into the vestibule and uh, carrying a uh, grocery bag with them. And they produced this giant ball of aluminum foil. And when ripping it all apart, inside was a jar. And inside that jar was a single cicada <laughs> that you see here. Was it alive? Sorry. It was dead. So I said, thankfully it's dead. I took it right there on the, on the, on the door, right in front. I got a scalpel, cut it in half and showed the fat and the muscle and all that stuff. I said, nobody would ever, you know, nobody would ever make each one of these hairs. I mean, it's too expensive to do a lot of stuff. This is, this is a natural real scare. They said, okay, okay. Reach in their bag and grab another aluminum foil one. Mm -hmm. Same thing, but a live cicada. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not cutting open a live cicada. That's the same thing as the other one. And what they had read was the Navy has this new cicada program, close in covert autonomous disposable aircraft. <laughs> and I'm, I mean, I'm a diagnostician, so I can probably tell the difference, but <laughs> I'm not sure if you can tell the difference between our annual cicadas and the Navy cicadas. So uh, I didn't have to cut those open or anything like that. So. Anyway, uh, there's also other weird little mysteries like this unknown microscopic chart. This is actually a call for all of you because we none of us can figure out what this is. So this we've seen this on many different plants. You have to magnify. You can't see it right there, obviously, because these each that's a quarter of a millimeter long bar right there. So they're definitely not insect eggs. They're way too small to be insect eggs. They're almost always in sets of eight. And I this is on a fern. I just got a sample with them on from the same yard in the same garden on parsley and on thyme and on all these other things. We tried to amplify it for fungal DNA. We couldn't figure out what it is. None of the pathologists or none of the mycologists know what it is. So it's a mystery. It is just super weird. I would love to know what it is. You weren't able to get DNA from it? No, they're so small and we, we were just unable. But if I, I have some more dry specimens, I might try again. But we also don't know what primers to use either. We don't even know what it is. I mean, it's like so totally weird. Call anyway, the Call the so, What's that? Call the <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. I'll have to, I'll have to wrap it in the room for first. But. So anyway, uh, finally, advice for becoming a diagnostician. Not that you all need to hear this, but some of you may. Uh, get familiar with a lot of arthropod groups. Uh, knowledge of plants helps too, of course. Uh, practice keying out specimens. You will not escape keys or descriptions. Uh, hone techniques for finding literature and other resources. Build relationships with other experts, which is you all have probably gotten an email from me to ask about an ID, I'm sure. Actually, I literally know, I know I've sent almost all of you an email to ask about an ID. 
Uh, but nothing compares to experience. And that's really one of the keys is just seeing the things over and over again. Um, and I think that's it. That's all I have. So hopefully I'll be But, uh, and, and any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yes. I know you touched on, uh, you did like a pie chart of things of like where you're finding where, and I saw that there's a section of just like humans. Just the was that the only yeah. thing you found that like, what is the most common insect that comes from a human body? That yeah, like well, and so there's been a big discussion in MPDN about whether that should even be a host because, well, Luckily, our data is pretty anonymous. It only goes by county, it's county level, host county level, and pet host, pest county level, date, all that stuff. But like, but nothing really identifying because there's HIPAA concerns about the medical stuff, whatever. But um, that is actually often ticks. That's one of the things. Um, but also, a lot of these pollution parasites is cases. They, you know, they'll either enter it as household domestic dwellings or humans, people. Um, yeah. So it's it's just how it is, and most of the time. It's ticks or that. that. Those are kind of the most common ones. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is kind of tangent, but sure. what is the lens that you use to capture the photos of the mites? Oh, the mites. Ooh. Really, really tiny. Yeah. yeah. I, I'd have to look it up, but uh, well, it's a. So what I did was I um, I built my own stacking system basically uh, from all the different parts. So I have a cognizant stack, a stepper, and I basically took my old SLR, put it on a copy stand facing down. And so my normal, for many insects and kind of decent sized things, I'll use an MPE uh, uh, 65 day, the Canon really nice 5X magnification one. But what I did for, I started to want to get really tiny, like that flea, the flea head, uh, the flea is, is one of these. But um, basically I scavenged some objectives from the lab. There were some old microscopes and I scavenged these really basic, just a single lens. It's not these really infinity crazy, you know, you can buy them honestly for like 25 to 50 bucks. And so the 20X one on some extension ring tubes, I cut a hole in a body cap for the uh, mm -hmm. for the camera and put it on the end of the extension tubes and then put that lens in the middle of the hole, put some whack, some blue tack around it. I was gonna use a nut or something like that, but it works fine. And I actually have them on different, keep their own caps and I just switch them up. So I have a 4X, a 10X and a, 20, a 20X. The 20X at that distance gets the, the mites pretty well. Um, they're still small, fairly small in the frame, but you prop it down and everything. Um, and I have to put on the scale bars afterward. But the, the real trick with those is actually getting still, uh, which actually also, so many of those, I, I will freeze them and kill them and then bring them out and right as they thaw, I'll take those photos. They're natural, they're standing. Problem is some of those tiny mites, even though they're a quarter of a millimeter long, I left some in the freezer for a week and they were still alive. So it's that was really annoying, obviously. But others, they sit there and they're very happy and feeding. And you can get if they're not like moving their, their arms or whatever, their legs, you can get those stacked enough photos. And so it's been, I, it's sometimes it's sometimes a bit of work, but I'm really proud of it because a lot of the mite people are like, I've never seen like this close of a mite, you know, other than an SEM or something. And so it's been fun to be able to do that. It is frustrating, especially when I'm dealing with all these other samples coming in, I'm like, I've got these mites and I want them fresh and then I got to take photos of them. And yeah, so it gets a little distracting, but uh, I try my best, especially for the really cool mites. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible. Like I've seen studio shots of larger insects, but that's so oh, and the, tiny. And the working distance is about a millimeter or two. Yeah. So you're really, the lens is almost on top of it. And so if you want to get a, a side angle, I have to cut the leaf so it's right at the edge so that I'm not, I'm not going crashing into the leaf and messing everything up. And so it takes a lot of patience, um, but I'd be happy to show you that at some, at some point. Yeah, yeah, it's very impressive. Yeah. yeah. I have a lot of questions okay, about your cool. photo process and I don't <laughs> want to just like, yeah. but um, I was, I assumed you were probably freezing them to calm them down for some of those, but what about, I know you have some that seem to be taken like in the wild, like what do you do then? Just hope real hard they stay still? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess I'm always hoping they stay still, so I don't have to say it. But uh, yeah, um, I'd say I lose 30 to 50 percent of them. Yeah. I'm trying to, especially flies. That's the problem too. <laughs> flies are, uh, I think, the worst group to like because they are so mobile and they just leave. But and also a giant. I'm a giant, so like getting close to these little things, I scare them. I'm my shadow coming from like <laughs> 20 feet away. So it's really, 
tough for me. Uh, so basically I have to sneak up on them really carefully and snap those few shots really quickly. And, and I get, I, I use, I, I do single shots typically on the field and oh. I use a flash to control the light so that I can freeze it and get a good exposure. So I take one, you know, and I often take several shots of it sitting there to get the best shot uh, mm. later on. But yeah, it's a lot of breathing exercise, a lot of creeping up on them. And then honestly, I'm about to take the, the photo and it's flying it's off. And if it's something rare, then I'm really irritated. Because <laughs> all of you would say, just collect it. And, and that's what most entomologists should do is collect these things. But honestly, for me, having the live, you know, habitus oh, sure. photo of, a, of, a, of an insect, especially a rare one, even if it gets away, is more important to me because sometimes you'll never see it. You only see these things on pins and they're all kind of whatever. And it's like, to get the actual stance and stuff like that. Really nice. Yeah. Like you use some sort of diffuser with your flash? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I have a handheld flash. Now, that is the advantage of being big. Is I can hold my camera in one hand and hold the flash in the other. And so I can, I actually can use the flash to kind of, you know, uh, maneuver it wherever I want to light it however I want. Um, as I found, what happened is I've gone through a lot of iterations of cameras. So um, I used to have 105 millimeter on extension tubes to get like really tiny things. I'd have a hood over with dual lights like Alex Wild uses, but he photographs when those are ants, which you can get right under there. Mm -hmm. But I'd find, okay, I'm out photographing an ant, and then there's this really beautiful moth on this tree, and it's like, you know, three inches wide. It's like, if I get it under that hood, first of all, it's gonna be, almost well, it's gonna be out of frame, and also it's just gonna be scared away. So that's why I adopted, I adopted the method of having this handheld flash where I could just then and like stand back and point the flash at the thing on the tree and get it bigger. It, it allowed me to, to really get more things, get photos of more things more flexibly. I don't think it, sometimes the results aren't as good, but um, yeah, yeah, that's, and I do workshops and, and talks about photography too. And um, if you, yeah, if you want specifics about equipment and stuff, I can totally tell you, show you this at some point. Oh, the question's online. Yeah. Well, there's a there's lot of very 20... positive comments. So oh, cool. People enjoyed it and stuff. Great. You can probably click on Couple. it. Mm. Oh, yeah. I could actually, yeah. Probably also they want to show it to their, oh. to their taxonomy classes. Oh, cool. What's that? Oh, so let's see. It? Yeah, maybe you might want to. I'm just going to see. <laughs> let's see. Well, there's one here. It says, in the plant pass side, do folks culture samples anymore? Uh, yes, yes. We we actually, you know, uh, molecular work has done a lot for plant pathogens, but honestly, the people in the lab are mostly morphological, you know, um, taxonomists and, and uh, identifiers. So they do a lot by, um, you know, just moist chambers and, and looking at spores and uh, they culture out certain things on different media, selective media for like uh, uh, certain pathogens. Um, molecular work is required or is necessary for certain either really you know, specific samples, like we suspect this is something new and we would need to confirm that, um, or difficult sample, difficult things. Uh, for instance, we we have to identify, we we get a lot of, and I, actually a funny thing is a lot of these are insect vector things. So xylella, which is a leaf hopper vector bacterium that causes scorch and pierces disease in grapes. We have to use uh, uh, ELISA methods or, or, or PCR methods to identify that because you just can't, cult, you know, you can't, identify that bacterium from uh, morphologically or anything like that um, and other things too. So yeah, but yeah, we, they look at, I would say 90% of the time they're looking at the actual organisms to identify them. Okay. So Farrow says, I was in grad school at Jim Baker, which knows what happened. Nice. Um, the cool spider fit in our B lab in the basement of the old schoolhouse. Oh, mm -hmm. Kansas is a hot spot for, for recluses. So I will not uh, debate or like, uh, you know, I do have to say, oh, you know, everybody in North Carolina has gotten bit by one. It's like, yeah, almost certainly not. I mean, we do know that there are cases, but it's mostly just a bacterial infection or something like that. But if you're in Kansas or Missouri or Arkansas or somewhere like that, then totally possible. It's uh, they're really common there. And so, you only do stuff from North Carolina? Yeah, we, we do accept out of state samples. We have special uh, for insects, they have, they have to be killed and sent dead. We can't accept live 
uh, specimens from out of state through our USDA per permits. We can accept uh, packages from out of state, but we have to work with, it, with them under biosafety cabinet and stuff like that. Um, and there's certain regulations and, and procedures for doing so. And so we do get people from other states submitting stuff. And the projects too, I, you know, because I, on Twitter and, you know, international national audience and, and collaborators, you know, I, I work with a lot of different people on, in different states, um, but mostly North Carolina is what we focus on. And, but North Carolina is great. It's, it's beautiful state. It is super variable from the mountains to the beach. You know, we have subtropical areas to mountainous, you know, Ap the Appalachians. And we also have a huge number of agricultural systems. It's actually really daunting. In fact, and, and with the pathologists, especially trying to figure out who is going to handle what types of hosts, we'll, we'll get in sesame now because people are starting to grow sesame and, and stuff. And so it's like, who's going to handle that? Who knows about but we have like huge Christmas tree industry. We have huge, the uh, biggest sweet potato production in the world, uh, peanuts, but then everything else, corn, tobacco, soybean, it's like everything. And because we have so many different habitats and so many different climates, you just grow everything, which also makes it difficult. So it's not like out Midwest where it's like all corn and wheat. And we have both those, but we also have everything else. So it, it gets really difficult, but also interesting. It's really interesting. Yeah. Africanized bees in, I'm sorry, yeah. Africanized bees in North Carolina? I think they are. They show up there. We do have a lab that helps identify them, I think, genetically. Um, there's actually, we do have uh, an apiculturalist who does also, there's the, the queen bee disease, the bee disease lab. So sometimes we get, we get their samples and vice versa. So then just, then somebody just sends us to the disease lab. You know, we, we actually got some blood samples from a dog the other, the other week, and it was for the vet school for their lab. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's all these labs around and, and stuff and people get there. But yeah, so there there are there they try to identify them. I don't know how frequently they're identified in North Carolina. Yeah. So you mentioned that you get a lot of like your Edithia like photos. Um and I don't know how many of <laughs> all of us have gotten a blurry photo and asked, what is this? <laughs> uh how often I guess do you get like photos where it's just like unrecognizable that you have to ask for more? Well, so I'm really good. <laughs> uh, but but they honestly, I went through our database to try and find examples of bad photos for for the agents and stuff. And honestly, I could not find that many that were like unidentifiable. Like it also depends on how specific you want. I mean, if you're asking me what species of board fly this is from a photo, I'm not gonna be able to tell you it, but I will be able to tell you it's a board fly if it's you know, uh, and I've seen so many of these pictures, it's like I'm like the slow AI where I've been learning these photos for years <laughs> and just like. Yeah, AI will replace me too at some point. But um, but yeah, it's a surprisingly really if it, if it comes down to it's bad enough, it's honestly it's usually it's just it's a decent photo, but it's something you can't identify from the photo, or it's this the angles or whatever. And at that point, I probably I usually just try and tell them to send it in. We also wave fees if it's something interesting that we want to encourage somebody to send in. Uh, we'll say we won't charge you for this one. We'll give you a report, all that stuff. But we really want that specimen, like that kissing bug. I was like, I want that specimen, so we won't charge you the fee. We'll, we'll give you the service, and that's how I get some of the best things. Uh, oh, it's really awesome. good. Things. Yeah. Remember, when I was at Penn State. Somebody sent in a, a postcard. They take a piece of scotch tape and they're <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> those are fun too. Scotch tape is good though, because you can actually still get them off. I get the burn mites on them, and I can actually still remove them very easily and put them on. And they're flat though already for the size of the tree. Um, but we have gotten in aphids on uh, alfalfa in an envelope, or like a caterpillar in an envelope, and just like oh, you can imagine what we get, or like a rotten spider in a vial, and like put in you know put in some preservative or something like that and send it in. But yeah, it's uh, some of the samples that come in there are interesting. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions online? Are there any more I see questions some. Let's see. Yeah, maybe. Oh, cool. Some more questions on the. I see some. I see a lot of familiar names too. Maybe something about technical help. I think I saw one. <laughs> Yeah, it was a vegetarian. Yeah, cool. So now there's, oh, look at all these people. I wish, I, I wish all of you were here. I see so many familiar names. It's really great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, yeah.